வணக்கம் தே கோயின் டு டாக் அபவுட் த டிஃப்ரெண்ட் வேஸ் இன் விச் த ஃபேலஞ்சஸ் ஆஃப் த ஃபிங்கர்ஸ் கேன் பி ஃப்ராக்சர்ட் அட் த நெக் அண்ட் ஷாஃப்ட் தே கோயின் டு டாக் அபவுட் த அம்டீன் நம்பர் ஆஃப் வேஸ் இன் விச் தீஸ் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் கேன் பி ஃபிக்ஸ்ட் அண்ட் ஆல்சோ விச் டைப் ஆஃப் ஃபிக்சேஷன் இஸ் நீடட் ஃபார் விச் டைப் ஆஃப் ஃப்ராக்சர் அண்ட் தே கோயின் டு டாக் அபவுட் த டூ பக் பேர்ஸ் that are going to affect our results very adversely and of course we're going to talk about how we can tackle these two bug bears when we talk about the phalangeal fractures of the neck and shaft we shall be looking at the features the management options and since there are so many management options we shall need to look at the decision making process and how the protocol of management is going to be decided customized for each patient though we shall be giving more importance to the management of fractures of the proximal phalanx neck and shaft fractures of the middle phalanx are also important when the middle phalanx is fractured it is usually a transverse fracture and the angulation of the middle phalangeal fracture is variable the skin access to expose this fracture would be through the dorsum with a cross finger flap like incision which will be described later in this video open reduction and fixation of such a fracture is quite important it consists of reduction of the fracture and pinning with a single k wire extending longitudinally from the distal phalanx across the distal interphalangeal joint into the middle phalanx and fixing the fracture internal fixation is ideal to avoid the complications like malunion nonunion and mallet deformity due to tendon adhesions we shall deal with the fractures of the proximal phalanx of the fingers by considering the fractures of the neck and the fractures of the shaft separately phalangeal fractures of the neck are very common in children especially and they result when the child violently attempts to withdraw a finger trapped in a closing door fractures of the neck of the phalanges can also occur in adults due to machinery injuries obtaining a true lateral x-ray is very important to note the amount of angulation alkatan has classified the fractures of the phalangeal neck especially in children into three types type 1 which indicates non displaced fracture type 2 where the fracture is displaced with some bone to bone contact present and type 3 denoting completely displaced fracture with no bone to bone contact type 2 phalangeal fracture has been further classified into type 2a which has a transverse fracture line type 2b with an oblique fracture line type 2c with a dorsal bony flange present on the distal fragment and type 2d with a very small distal fragment the completely displaced type that is type 3 has also been classified into four subtypes type 3a where the head is rotated 90 degrees type 3b where the head is rotated 180 degrees type 3c where the head lies on the dorsal side of the proximal fragment of the bone and type 3d where the head lies on the volar side of the proximal part of the fractured bone type 3b is said to occur when traction is applied to a type 3a fracture the space is increased and this fractured head which has no soft tissue attachments except the collateral ligament just rotates into that gap that is formed and turns itself 180 degrees though the pictorial representation is for the middle phalanx it applies for the proximal phalanx also as mentioned phalangeal neck fractures can also occur in adults especially following machinery injuries these fractures are angulated volarly hence they can be something like a type 3a fractures What we see on the x-ray is an end-on view of the rotated distal fracture fragment. Fractures of the shaft of the phalanx, either middle phalanx or proximal phalanx can be transverse, spiral or oblique or comminuted. Let us try to understand how they are classified like this. 
in a transverse fracture the fracture line is perpendicular to the axis of the bone in an oblique fracture the axis of the fracture is at more than 30 degrees to the perpendicular in a spiral fracture the fracture line on the dorsum of the phalanx is not the same as the fracture line on the volar aspect of the phalanx and in a comminuted fracture there is a segmental crushing of the bone into multiple segments in proximal phalangeal fractures there is an apex volar angulation that is the apex of the angulation points volarly because the proximal fragment is flexed by the strong interosseous muscle insertion the patient with a fracture of the shaft of the phalanx presents with a history of injury pain and swelling a typical deformity and sometimes abnormal mobility we shall see the options available for management of fractures of the shaft of the phalanges the first is close reduction and immobilization in a splint or cast or it could be a close reduction external fixation or close reduction and percutaneous pinning the other options are open reduction and fixation with k wires lag screws or platen screws let us first consider the option of close reduction and immobilization this option is indicated for undisplaced fractures of the shaft of the proximal phalanx or the middle phalanx or displaced fractures that are amenable for close reduction and are stable on reduction a check x ray will help decide if the check x ray shows good alignment close reduction and immobilization is the best option of management after a close reduction of the fracture a forearm based volar splint pop is applied with the wrist in 30 degrees extension metacarpophalangeal joint in 90 degrees of flexion and nearly full interphalangeal joint extension as mentioned a check x ray needs to be taken and more importantly we must check the viability of the finger after the reduction and immobilization this immobilization must be continued for 3 weeks at the end of 3 weeks we need to start protected range of movement exercises with support follow up x rays at weekly intervals need to be taken to confirm the fracture healing a straightening splint for the finger must be applied at rest the therapy must consist of active range of movement exercises and gentle passive range of movement exercises this young man sustained a simple fracture of the shaft of the proximal phalanx of the left hand index finger this was immobilized in a pop slab for 3 weeks and this is the outcome at the end of 1 month after removing the pop and instituting therapy the option of close reduction and external fixation would be indicated in comminuted diaphyseal fractures comminuted articular fractures and open fractures with concomitant soft tissue injuries like gunshot wounds or high speed injuries like road traffic accidents and in fractures with significant loss of bone stock in these indications the advantages of close reduction and external fixation are the ease of insertion and minimal dissection is required so the devascularization of soft tissue and bone is minimized preservation of the bony length is possible and at the same time it provides access for soft tissue care and even skin flap covers can be done the risk of devitalization of small fracture fragments which may have a tenuous blood supply is also not there the technique consists of applying two transverse pins placed proximal and distal to the fracture being inserted through the midaxial or dorsolateral incisions a fluoroscopy assist will help in good alignment of the fracture once the fracture has been completely reduced connecting rods and swivel clamps are applied stability can be achieved with a single half frame if necessary another half frame may be added studies have shown that 90% union rate has been achieved when using external fixation for acute hand fractures if we are able to achieve a close reduction of the fracture it would be ideal if we can put in a wire percutaneously 
There are three techniques available for transverse phalangeal fracture fixation with percutaneous pinning. In the first technique, the fracture is reduced in a 90-90 fixed position that is fixing the metacarpophalangeal joint in 90 degrees and fixing the proximal interphalangeal joint in 90 degrees and compressing the two so that the fracture is fixed and then introducing a K-wire in the retrocondylar fossa in the proximal phalanx and driving the wire proximally into the proximal segment. When doing this, a slight reverse bowing of the pin while it is being drilled is necessary because only then it will give adequate stability in the normal dorsal bowing of the proximal phalanx. The second technique is used for percutaneous pinning of fractures of the proximal half of the shaft. Here the wires are passed from proximal to distal and crossed wiring can be done also. For extra articular fractures near the base of the proximal phalanx, the third technique can be used where the percutaneous wire passes through the metacarpophalangeal joint and then into the distal segment. This technique requires a POP immobilization for three weeks. So closed reduction and percutaneous pinning can be done for transverse, spiral or oblique fractures of the proximal phalanx. The obvious advantages being the fracture is stabilized with minimal injury to the soft tissue sleeve and mobilization can be started from 5 days post-operatively except in technique 3 where immobilization of the metacarpophalangeal joint will be required for 3 weeks till the pin is removed. But still the proximal interphalangeal joint motion can be started from 5 days. With this method of management Good or excellent results have been reported in 90% of fractures treated within 5 days of injury. In addition to the techniques described, for oblique fractures, multiple transverse K-wires can be inserted percutaneously. And by this technique, the full range of motion was achieved in 18 of 22 patients with 26 long oblique fractures of the proximal phalanx treated by close reduction and two or three percutaneous pins perpendicular to the fracture. However, there are some situations where none of these techniques that we have described so far will work. And in those situations, we need to do an open reduction and internal fixation. The indications for open reduction and internal fixation are if an unstable proximal and middle phalangeal fracture cannot be reduced or it is unstable after reduction and a percutaneous pinning is not possible due to many reasons like non-availability of C-arm. After open reduction, the fixation may be done by one of the three major options K-wires and the modifications, lag screws and platen screws. For open reduction, we need to first make an incision. The dorsal approach consists of a dorsal lazy yes, longitudinal incision made over the phalangeal region. But the disadvantage of this incision is scar addition to the underlying extensor tendon and the fracture line. The midaxial approach consists of an incision along the neutral line of the finger and the cross finger flap like incision that is made to raise the flap, expose the extensor tendon and the fracture line and also avoids a direct suture line over the fracture site. But the skin incision alone is not enough to expose the fracture. We need to get an approach through the extensor apparatus also. This can be through the dorsal extensor approach of Pratt where the dorsal apparatus is split longitudinally and then closed with a running pullout wire suture and here the scarring of the dorsal apparatus to the skin and bone is present, which is a disadvantage. In the lateral extensor approach of Posner, the mid-lateral incision is made and retraction or excision of one of the lateral bands is done to expose the fracture. And this approach is to the side to which the distal fragment has shifted. Once the approach has been made, the fixation needs to be done, whether it is with K-wires, lag screws, or platen screws. Open reduction and internal fixation of phalangeal fractures is very commonly done using K-wires. 
The advantages of using K wires is that very minimal soft tissue stripping is required. So the preservation of the blood supply to the bone ensures enhanced healing potential. The K wires are less bulky when compared to the plates and screws. So the dorsal apparatus is not impaled and easier closure of soft tissues is possible. And most importantly, K wires are very easily available. But more than all these advantages, the greatest advantage is that K wires are very versatile and they can be used in many fracture configurations. Like for instance, for transverse or short oblique fractures, longitudinally or obliquely applied K wires are useful. For long oblique fractures, the K wires can be applied perpendicular to the fractures. And for transverse fractures, ideally crossed K wires can be used. But this technique is pretty intricate and distraction may be a problem if the wires are not applied correctly. When talking about the techniques of K wire fixation for phalangeal fractures, the intramedullary fixation can be done using a straight K wire. That is, the K wire is applied on the dorsal aspect in a straight orientation. It could be applied obliquely or in the form of crossed K wires. The strategies for application that is centrifugal application or centripetal application has been discussed in an earlier video. You can click on the icon above to access that video. While applying K wires for fixation of phalangeal fractures, there are some important points to be noted. The head of the proximal phalanx must not be damaged in the bargain. After the fixation has been done, Passive proximal interphalangeal joint movements must be full and free. The free end of the wire must be proximal that is at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint and not distally at the level of the PIP joint. And finally, a support with the POP is very essential because the fixation by K wire is not rigid fixation. Now a common question is what about the end of the K wire that is protruding outside? Should we bury it? or should we let it protrude outside the skin so that it will be easy to remove. A study done in 2001 showed that there was no difference in the infection rate between the buried and protruding pins. Though advantages in many ways, the use of K wires does have a few disadvantages. It does not provide stable fixation and it is important to give immobilization. So this splint immobilization may lead to tendon adhesions and stiffness. So, when K wires are used as fixation for phalangeal fractures, the therapy must be intense and very well supervised. In this clinical example, the patient has a displaced fracture of the neck of the proximal phalanx of the midfinger and an undisplaced fracture of the shaft of the index finger. The fracture on the neck of the middle finger was fixed with a single K wire and a POP support. Since there were associated soft tissue injuries, they were also taken care of at the same time. This is the result at the end of three months with complete healing of the soft tissues, full range of active movements and good healing of the fractures of both the index and middle fingers. The K wire was removed at the end of three weeks. In this patient who has sustained a fracture of the shaft of the proximal phalanx of the little finger has had an open reduction and internal fixation using a single K wire with the POP support. The outcome in the form of movements of the finger are noted here. As we have already seen, K wires are pretty versatile and they can also be used with other modifications or additional fixation techniques to provide better stability to the fracture. The first modification is the use of composite or tension band wiring where the fracture stability is enhanced when K wires are supplemented with stainless steel wire of 26 gauge. This technique is particularly useful in transverse, spiral and oblique fractures. The second modification is the use of interosseous wiring either alone or as a supplement to K wire fixation. As shown in the first two pictures where the interosseous wires have been used at 90-90 degrees orientation or in the form of parallel fixation or in the third picture where the interosseous wire has been used to supplement the K wire fixation. 
The advantage of this technique is very minimal exposure is required and this hardware is less prominent than screws and plates, hence minimizing the risk of additions to the overlying tendons. But the biggest disadvantage of using interosseous wiring is that the foreign body that is the stainless steel wire is retained within the bone. Large screws can be used for the fixation of phalangeal fractures. They are ideally used for oblique fractures, either short oblique, long oblique fractures or spiral fractures. The use of screws for fixation enhances the stability by the lag technique by providing interfragmentary compression. When used for the fixation of oblique fractures, a minimum of two screws are necessary and they should be inserted at least two screw diameters from the fracture edge. For the proximal phalanx fracture fixation, 2 mm and 1.5 mm screws are used and for middle phalanx fractures, 1.5 mm and 1.3 mm screws can be used. For transverse fractures, headless cannulated screws can be used by percutaneous fixation technique. The obvious advantage of using lag screws is that early mobilization can be started avoiding the problems of additions and joint stiffness. Generally, plate and screws provide an excellent method of rigid fixation in any fracture. But as far as phalangeal fractures are concerned, there are different considerations. Though the advantages of stable fixation and the possibility of early range of motion is present, the extensive stripping of the periosteum that is required and the bulk that is added to the volume of the finger do cause many complications. A study done showed that the total active digital motion was less than 180 degrees in 62% of fractures for which plate and screw fixation had been done and open fractures had particularly poor prognosis. In another study, it was found that the results were good only in 26%, fair in 33% and poor in 41% of fractures fixed with plate and screws. And as expected, when there was considerable soft tissue injury, good results were seen only in 5%. Usually, mini condylar plates of about 1.5 mm for phalanges and 2 mm for metacarpals have been used. But to overcome the complications caused by plate and screw fixation for phalangeal fractures. Thinner microplates of about 0.8 mm are being increasingly used. They are advantageous because the screws are self-tapping, less periosteal stripping is required, plates are low profile and since the stability provided by the use of these plates is less, supplemental K wires can be used. Now we have seen many methods of management of phalangeal fractures. Now we need to understand how to take a decision about which fracture must be fixed by which technique. So to help in the decision making, we need to understand four characteristics of any fracture that we see. The stability of the fracture, whether it is open or closed, associated injuries that are present and the fracture geometry. The stability of a fracture can be determined both clinically and radiographically. Unstable fractures are those with the potential to rotate, angulate or shorten. But how do we assess these characteristics? Rotation instability is difficult to judge radiographically and is best assessed clinically by having the patient actively flex their fingers and looking for digital overlap or scissoring. Angulation deformity can also be assessed both clinically and radiologically. Clinical assessment of the coronal plane angulation that is side to side angulation can be assessed by digital overlap on flexion and sagittal plane angulation can be noted by the compensatory hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint, something like a pseudo claw deformity of the involved finger. Shortening is typically seen in comminuted fractures and assessed both radiographically and clinically. It is also important to note whether it is an open fracture or closed fracture 
and this will play an important role in making a decision. Open phalangeal shaft fractures usually result from direct high energy trauma. Since the amount of intact soft tissue is less, there will be no support provided to the fracture by the soft tissues and this point must be taken into account when making a decision. Fractures with injuries to the adjacent structures such as nerves, vessels and soft tissue sleeve or tendons are usually open fractures. They require internal stabilization since the repair of the soft tissues is also a priority in these patients. It is not only soft tissue injuries. Sometimes there may be concomitant fractures either in the same finger or hand. Such fractures need operative fixation because it is difficult to maintain satisfactory alignment of multiple fractures by closed means. When we take into consideration the fracture geometry, we need to see whether it is a transverse fracture, oblique or spiral fracture or a comminuted fracture. To summarize the process of decision making, the fracture may be non-displaced or displaced. If the fracture is non-displaced, non-operative management is ideal. If the fracture is displaced and it is stable on closed reduction, non-operative management is advised. If it is unstable on closed reduction, internal fixation is ideal. If it is unstable and comminuted, external fixation is ideal. The time required for complete bony healing of phalangeal shaft fractures is typically 5 months, but the patient can return to work in 6 weeks. Having seen the expected outcomes, we do come across poor results in some of the situations. Like in this example where there is a fracture of the shaft of the proximal phalanx of the middle finger, there is a restricted movement of the fingers and a deformity that has developed. Why has this occurred? The first thing in the management of phalangeal fractures is the correct mode of management. And even after carrying out the correct mode of management, we need to remember that there are two bugbears that can totally compromise the results. Adhesions and joint stiffness. Adhesions can be prevented first by mobilization. This may not be possible all the time, especially if we are going to use techniques like non-operative management or K-wire fixation. Hence, in these situations, we need to start passive and active range of movements at the end of three weeks. Delaying this mobilization may result in formation of additions. Massage to the scar also helps in releasing the flimsy additions that may form in the course of three weeks. Joint stiffness, on the other hand, is mainly caused by incorrect immobilization. Hence, a correct immobilization technique, that is, keeping the proximal interphalangeal joint in complete extension, is very important to prevent joint stiffness. At three weeks, again, we need to start stretching of the proximal interphalangeal joint, and even after mobilization is started, we need to advise a straight splint to ensure that the proximal interphalangeal joint is kept in a straight position. To prove that good therapy can give good results, let us see this clinical example of a patient who had a compound comminuted fracture of the mid shaft of the right hand ring finger. Due to the concomitant soft tissue injury and the nature of the fracture, the fracture was molded and non-operative management was done using immobilization with a POP slab. At three weeks, the POP was removed and an intensive therapy protocol was started as we have already described. This was the fracture healing at the end of two months and the healing of the wounds and the resulting range of movement is also noted. I hope you liked this video. I enjoyed making it. Please do click on the shown links to see more about the management of fractures of the terminal phalanx and the head of the proximal phalanx. And do not forget to subscribe to keep connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery, trauma surgery and ethics. Vanakkam.